My name um, is, is Chad Page. I am currently the Extension Sheep and Goat Specialist here at Utah State University. Um, I grew up in Chandler, Arizona, where I grew up with sheep and goats and poultry of about every kind. And from there, I went on to do graduate school, specifically focusing on nutrition with sheep. And I have a beautiful wife and four rambunctious children, and they keep me pretty busy. Um, but overall, we're very passionate about animal agriculture, and we really love uh, small ruminants or sheep and goats. And so today I'm going to give a talk on considerations for a successful kidding and lambing season. Um, I probably won't be going into as much detail on how to castrate a lamb or how to dock tails or anything like that, but I do want to bring up some subjects that are broad enough to help our producers and even some of us that are newer to this to avoid big issues that we often occur during this time of year when we're lambing and kidding. So just kind of want to introduce this time of year of lambing and kidding really is the best time of year. It's really fun. New babies are exciting and they get us excited about agriculture, um, get us excited about farming and also about uh, our animals, right? Re whether we're raising goats or sheep or alpacas or horses or whatever it may be, um, new life, bringing new life to the world is often very exciting. So with that though, it can also be very stressful at times. Uh, there's a joke that a lot of marriages uh, can, can live or die based around the lambing season. Um, but this picture here kind of shows that, that picture perfect scenario where we have either a doe or a ewe that has her lambs and kids. Generally, we want twins, right? Um, when we have a species that can give us multiples. And so this is kind of our perfect picture perfect scenario. One of the biggest things when talking to producers that I realize is important to the lambing season often is the decisions you make before the lambing season. So one thing I wanted to point out and try to teach some of us today is that ruminant animals, so those animals like sheep, goats, cows, elk, deer, those animals are born with a very immature immune system. It's not functioning to its full capacity. And so it's really important that the colostrum they get from their mother provides them the antibodies they need to fight off disease and things like that. So one of the best things we could do for those lambs at lambing is actually to give a booster vaccination to the mother approximately two to four weeks before lambing, okay? And this allows those antibodies to build up in that U and to provide those antibodies in the colostrum for the lamb. This is what we would call passive transfer, passive immunity. So we would transfer those antibodies to the lamb. And then in two to three weeks when those lambs have their own active immune system, um, then they can get a booster vaccination themselves. But if we were to just give them those lambs a vaccination right after birth within those first 24 hours, that really wouldn't help because at that time they don't have the mature immune system in order to build up their own antibodies. The recommended, at, at least the recommended thing that we give is a Clostridium perfringes type C and D and tetanus toxoid vac vaccination. Oftentimes we just call this a CD&T and you can find it at your local tractor supply or Cal Ranch or IFA. And this is what we would want to give to those used as a booster shot prior to lambing. <clears throat> this will also help if to avoid abortions um, and things like that. And so early death loss of lambs to make sure that they have the proper immunity they need. Another thing that can be really helpful and maybe isn't as applicable to goats um, is shearing before lambing. Now, it's becoming more and more difficult to find people who are able to shear sheep. Um, probably one of my best recommendations is to look on KSL or 
or some other site that people are actively posting um, that they're available to share. And those individuals can generally do a pretty good job. If not, contact some of the other, you know, sheep and goat, sheep producers around you. And oftentimes they have recommendations. But I'm a really big fan of trying to share ewes prior to lambing. And there's a bunch of different reasons why we do this. It often gives a cleaner environment, um, drier environment too, less moisture that's held up in the wool. It reduces mastitis or the spread of ex external parasites from the ewe to the lamb. Um, it improves the fleece quality because oftentimes around lambing or cases of mastitis, um, the, there's so many nutrients that are going to the growth of that lamb or to other aspects of the animal that that wool actually becomes a little tender right around that time of lambing. So getting that fleece off early, right before lambing really helps to have a better fleece um, after shearing. Ewes also fit a little better, better at the feed bunk. There's not as much wool on them so they can get to the feed a little bit better. And then most of all is that lambs have easier access to the teat. So they're not reaching up and accidentally sucking on a small dirty piece of wool or something else. And so things are nice and clean. They're able to get up and find where they get their food from. If we're unable to shear, a recommendation I give is that we at least try to crutch the animal. Now, this term refers to coming and instead of shearing the whole animal like we see in this bottom corner of sheep, the top picture is a picture of a crutched ewe. And so this ewe will be turned over and just the wool around her back end around her belly and her udders will be removed and so that it's a little bit cleaner for the lamb when uh, we are lambing. So that, that's something that I find is really helpful also. So you can see that we're starting to get closer and closer to lambing. So we've, we've vaccinated our ewes, we've, we've shorn them if we're able to do that. Um, with our goats, we don't need to do that, although we still need to give a uh, vaccination, okay? Um, but as we get closer and closer to lambing, that last third of pregnancy is when those lambs are growing at a very fast rate. About 70% of the growth of those lambs in utero is going to happen in that last third of pregnancy. And so <clears throat> species like sheep and goats are really prone to something we call a pregnancy toxemia. We also call this twin lamb disease or um, ovine ketosis. So our small ruminant species that have multiple offspring oftentimes suffer from this. And really what it is, is that there's an inadequate amount of energy intake during late gestation. And it's generally because like this picture illustrates, those lambs grow so big in utero or those kids that they start pushing up against the rumen or the stomach of that ewe, and they decrease the capacity for them to eat larger amounts of feed. And so one thing that we need to do is think about supplementing a better energy source. So maybe this is in the form of um, corn or some other grain, or maybe we decide to buy alfalfa pellets, which reduces the, the particle size that they're consuming. So they're able to get more feed in them than if they were just eating maybe a lower quality hay. And so this helps to prevent um, pregnancy toxemia or twin lamb disease. <clears throat> if things start getting um, a little bit more severe, so early stages of pregnancy toxemia, you may see them come off feed or act a little lethargic. Sometimes we can treat them with a, essentially a glucose oral drench, and that can help them get enough blood glucose to, to come out of it. <clears throat> so now we've shorn our ewes, we've vaccinated, um, we're aware of some of the other disease, and now we're starting to look at some of the signs of parturition. So getting ready to start um, looking at when those lambs are actually gonna come. The pregnancy length on a sheep is around 121 days or five months, same with the goats. And so if we calculated it out, we would see that, okay, here, five months from breeding, we're ready to start lambing. 
And so we'll start looking for these signs. Some of the signs that that U is about to lamb within the next couple hours include an engorged udder, okay? Swollen vulva. Um, the U will also seclude herself to a certain area of the pen, oftentimes in the corner of the pen or away from other U's. Maybe if you're out in a pasture, she'll go over by a bush or something else. And this is a very strange behavior, right? Because we know that sheep and goats, for the most part, they really like to be with each other. We call that gregarious, okay? That's kind of a $5 word, but um, these animals are very gregarious and they like to be together. So when one of them separates themselves off, we should start asking ourselves, are they sick or some other things? But one of the times that it is okay is during this time of lambing where they're about to drop a lamb, they'll seclude themselves and they'll start kind of that behavior. Um, they also may go off feed, not be as interested in feed, okay? When that U does drop a water bag, um, within probably 30 minutes to an hour, we should expect that lamb to come, okay? Before we step in and maybe need to pull a lamb, um, make sure that everything is going correctly. If after 30 minutes or 40 minutes that that you or doe is struggling and, and heavy breathing, maybe we might want to put on a glove and, and make sure that everything is, is going okay. But ultimately the best, most ideal situation is that we would want that you or doe to have a lamb by herself, okay? Some things that may help us is, you know, watching sheep for, <laughs> seems like months on end sometimes can be very stressful and you can lose a lot of sheep because really we should be checking um, sleep, not sheep. Um, really we should be checking on our sheep or does um, probably every two to three hours, making sure that things are coming uh, out all right. So in the last slide, I talked about how, you know, after 30 minutes to an hour, we should be making sure that these mothers are having their lambs and kids appropriately. Well, that's kind of why we need to check them so often. One thing that I'm starting to see more and more that is really helping people are the use of these cameras in barns. A lot of them are fit with night vision or, or thermal type technology. And a lot of producers are able to just get up in the middle of the night, check on their phones, um, check on whatever device they have, and look to see if there's any ewes or does that are separating off that are starting to um, heavy breathe and to have, have those lambs, okay? Um, another benefit is that you get more sleep this way, right? It's as easy as turning over in bed, looking at your phone, everything's going okay, going back to bed. Also, um, if everything is going okay, you're not stepping in the barn and disturbing the natural order of things. You can let these sheep and goats um, have their baby in a more natural state, not, not as stressful you stepping into the barn. <clears throat> so here come the lambs. What do we need? Here's a brief list of some things that we should have on hand. Now, when we calculate out that five months, we really should be ready about a week and maybe even sooner before, have all our supplies ready, have the barn cleaned out or an area that we know things are gonna happen, okay? Um, because in any one day that that ewe is bred, generally she'll lamb, you know, five months out, either a week or before that, a week before or a week after that day. Some of the items we should have on hand are, include iodine at a 7% tincture or 7% uh, concentration. And this is used to dip the navel in iodine. This helps keep any infection off the lamb. Okay, helps dry up that navel also. We should maybe have some towels or disposable gloves um, or some sleeves if we need to help with lambing. Um, some OB lube, some lube to help if we need to reach into the animal to pull a lamb out. Some stomach tube and syringe for tube feeding lambs and we'll talk about that in just a second. A lamb colostrum or milk replacer, a rectal thermometer, and then an elastator for putting on bands for either castration or for docking tails, okay? So these are just, this is just a brief list and this can be more comprehensive, 
but these are some of the main items that I see used often. So what are the biggest killers of our lambs? Our biggest killers in those first 24 hours really are hypothermia and hypoglycemia. So either they get too cold or there's not enough energy in them. They don't have enough blood glucose. And so in order to combat those, one of the first things we should probably think about is if they're cold or not, okay? So hypothermia starts setting in. Some of us that maybe raise show lambs, we're trying to lamb in January, February, and things can be pretty cold then. And so in order to combat that, we have things like hot boxes where some warm air flows around the animal. And oftentimes if we can get that animal warmed up, they're able to get up and they're able to nurse a little bit better, okay? If you're unsure on whether or not they should be in a hot box or if you need to warm them up, you can use a rectal thermometer and the temperature for sheep shouldn't below, be below 99 degrees. Or sometimes you can just take your finger and kind of stick it in their mouth. You can feel if their mouth is cold or if they have a sucking reflex. And if they don't have a sucking reflex and they're shivering, they're probably too cold. Colostrum, like we talked about early on, those lambs are not born with an active immune system. So we want to make sure that they get that colostrum. It's vital to their health for these, these sheep and goats. Um, lambs and kids should get colostrum within the first 12 hours of life. Okay, This colostrum is packed with those antibodies, energy, vitamins, and minerals. Um, and rule of thumb, those animals should be getting at least 5%, probably closer to 10% of their body weight in colostrum. So an example of that is a 10 pound lamb would need bare minimum eight ounces of colostrum before that 12 hours. And you can do that by maybe um, most effective way illustrated here in this top picture is by putting a small tube down with a syringe and early on in those first couple hours, you can do four ounces of colostrum and then afterwards, uh, as you get a couple hours out, you can do another four ounces of colostrum. Now, I'm a big proponent of utilizing colostrum of that species. So sometimes maybe our, our you or doe doesn't produce colostrum and we're forced to use either colostrum replacer, or sometimes we can collect extra colostrum off another sheep or a doe, a, a goat, and we can save that for later. And some tricks I've seen that are really helpful are save it in ice cube trays or in little bags um, that maybe some mothers, humans use to collect milk that has measurements on it. So you know exactly how much colostrum is in there. And then as we thaw that out, we want to do it slowly with water. We don't want to put it in the microwave or it'll destroy all those antibodies and good nutrients that it has. Okay. So at least 5% of their body weight within those first 12 hours is crucial if they're not able to get it from their mother. <clears throat> and then milk replacers after that, um, I like to just point out not all milk replacers are the same, okay? It's ideal that an animal, okay, whether it's a, a sheep or goat, they're the ones feeding the lambs milk because it can be pretty costly to buy a milk replacer and feed it to the animal. The reason I kind of put up, I went through and I put all the different nutrient contents of different on the market milk replacers, both for lamb and for kids. Now I didn't put the names of all these, but I just want to point out that on average, the crude fat content of lamb milk replacer is higher than that of goats. And goats is even that much higher than cattle. Okay, so utilizing um, a species specific milk replacer is often very important, okay? Um, some tricks that you can utilize are putting some nipples on a bucket like this if you have a lot of orphan lambs and that can help um, you manage feeding these lambs instead of having to hold a bottle for each one of them. <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of mothering crates or we'll, so oftentimes we call these jugs or lambing pens. And these are essentially small pens that we can put the mother in with her lamb, either right after she's lambed, or maybe sometimes we put her in as she's lambing. Oftentimes we'll do it afterwards so that she's cleaned up the lamb um, and that there's not as, it's not as messy in that pen. 
We want to make sure it's bedded down really well, that it's clean. In between use, maybe we put down a little bit of lime to help uh, kill anything or keep down the ammonia smell, okay? Um, also, <clears throat> these lambs probably stay in there about 12 hours to 48 hours, depending on how many sheep you have and how fast you're moving through this system. But this really helps, especially first-time mothers, get acquainted with their lambs and those lambs get acquainted with their mothers, find, easily find where they need to nurse and, and get everything going. <clears throat> the next 20 to 30 days are gonna be really important to make sure you monitor the health of that lamb. A lot of death sometimes happens in that time frame, And so one thing that I recommend is that we put some kind of easily identified mark on the lamb and, and the mother so that we can easily say that is the mother of that lamb. Now, maybe we only have a few animals and you know exactly who goes with who, and that's not as important, but by putting on some marks like this, you know, maybe you put uh, a number on the sheep that goes with that lamb, you can easily identify that that lamb goes with that ewe and that she's taking care of that lamb appropriately and that the lamb is doing okay, growing and and has lots of energy, okay? Um, some ways you can do this are put a little bit of paint brand. Some people may do a little notch in the ear or put an ear tag in, and these can be, all be helpful ways. The paint brand is just easier to see from a longer distance. So you don't have to get close to the animal as you would with an ear tag. So after that, um, we've kept our lambs alive. We've done all those things prior to lambing and through lambing. I would just say enjoy, right? Raising animals is something that I truly love and uh, raising healthy, happy animals is something that I strive to do all the time. So I encourage all of you to do the same, maybe take some of these tricks. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to either answer some of those now or here's my contact information. Feel free to give me a call here at my office or you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to try to answer questions that way also. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Um, you did have uh, one question come up. And again, if uh, any of you sure. have any questions for Chad, we do have a few minutes here. We'll have a little bit of time for him to answer those. So go ahead and get those typed in. Um, but the question here is what brand or what type of camera do you, do you like to recommend for monitoring um, the lambs? So <clears throat> I think that kind of falls within your budget, right? So I, I've seen some cameras that um, I, I think what you need to do is make a list of the things that are important to you. So maybe night vision is something that's very important or, or maybe a playback feature or something like that is important to you instead of just purely a live feed. And then go and search for cameras that have those specific, um, specific characteristics or features and then see what falls within your budget. Because I've seen these cameras range from very cheap, under $100 that, um, that work really well for people. And I've seen them become very expensive. Expensive Sometimes when they're marketed for livestock specifically, they can be very expensive. So I think that just kind of depends on what you want and what you're uh, willing to spend. So I, don't, I, I try not to give a lot of brand recommendations, but more so just what you need. Okay, great. And then we have another question here. Uh, what about deworming? Do I need to deworm near kidding time? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I would say, yes, I didn't go into that. Parasites is something that we could talk about. Uh, actually last year for this conference, I talked all about parasites, external parasites and internal parasites. And so having a dewormer for your use prior to lambing is really important. And then also I talked about shearing. Shearing, after we shear, the best time to treat for external parasites would be right after shearing. To do a pour-on with some kind of permethrin-based uh, pour-on helps to either combat sheep lice or sheep keds and keep them from passing on to the lamb more or from getting in your environment, okay? Um, but as far as deworming, I think it is really important that, you know, around that time of vaccination, we deworm at the same time, and that helps to alleviate some of that stress that those animals may be experiencing. Okay. 
Great okay. question. That's a good question. That is a good one. Um, okay, another question here. When do you suggest castration? So um, the earlier, the better, I think. Um, if we're going to do it earlier with the Cheerios or the small bands, I generally like to do it in the, within the first couple days of life. And maybe your requirements on that are different. Maybe you uh, castrate the singles because you want just the twins to go on breeding. Okay. Um, but if they get older, you know, then two weeks, then we probably need another method of castration, either cutting that scrotum, um, or, or something else. Okay. So, but early on in life, the Cheerios or the, the little bands that I showed those work really well. I'd put one of those on making sure that you get both testicles in there. Okay. And then. Uh, I generally spray some fly spray around that. So if there is any kind of small um, abrasion or infection that we can keep any fly flies from landing on that. So another great question. Okay, and another question here uh, with kids, when would yeah. you dehorn and what would you use? Um, I have the kids I grew up with, I grew in Arizona, we mainly raised goats and sometimes we would disbud and take off those horns and other times we wouldn't. Um, I, there's a little bit of controversy amongst people uh, who, who have goats on whether that's a good thing or not. And I think that, um, I, I think it really comes down to what you want, but we would generally do it early on in life when they're just, you know, uh, a couple weeks older, and then we would use a small disbudding iron. And um, there are also some paste. Um, you just need to make sure that you put on the paste following the directions, but the disbudding irons work really well and it helps to cauterize that wound um, and take off those horns. So, yeah. Okay, great. And um, I don't see any other questions right now, but I want to encourage everybody, if you don't mind, just fill out the evaluation. Um, I know it says Ben's evaluation. We'll make sure that gets linked up to Chad's presentation, but just go ahead and treat that like that is uh, Chad's evaluation. Um, and I uh, want to make sure everybody realizes not to be shy to reach out to Chad if you have any additional yep. questions, even if you're really early in the process of, uh, of raising livestock. That's what he's here for, to help people. So he put his contact information up there. So that's great. Thank you so much uh, for that, Chad. And with that, okay. I'm going to um, turn it over. Oh, let me see if there's another question here. There may be that came in. Give me just one second. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, one more question. If you hold off castrating a lamb if it was, uh, quotations, if, why at birth? Yeah, so I do know some people who hold off castrating. So a lot of people that maybe are involved in the show industry or have some seed stock animals that they're not quite sure which ram will be the best. And so they kind of give more rams the ability to, to develop a little bit more before they decide to castrate one or another. And so that's one thing that I have seen that people wait a little bit longer to castrate. Um, if you're trying to sell to maybe an ethnic market, sometimes those ethnic markets, um, they prefer not to have castrated males. And so maybe even if you didn't get around to castrating, um, you can still sell to some ethnic markets and things like that, um, who actually they prefer not to castrate. And um, that's something to think about too. And so it just kind of depends on what your objectives are and, and what you want to do. So 